much better looking Osama <laughs> than the other one. And to those who are from Japan, I would say Konnichiwa. As was just introduced, I'll start with the recitation of a few verses of the Holy Quran, after which I will go through the translation, and then I'll give a brief introduction about Islam. But one thing that's more important is for the discussion. I mean, this group you call is there to learn, and that's something that's important for all of us. And one good way to learn is to engage through questions and answers. So I would like to encourage you, especially on the sister side, uh, to, to have some questions prepared, and then in about 20 or so minutes, we'll open the floor for discussion. The Holy Quran is revealed in Arabic, so I will recite it a few verses in Arabic, and then I will translate them to English. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم
But one thing that's extremely important it is for us to learn about each other's diversities. As Imam Ali said, who is the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, ignorance is the human being's worst enemy. And that is indeed a problem that we have in the world today, where there is a lot of ignorance, unfortunately. And when there is some ignorance, then people start to fear what they don't know. One aspect for us to overcome such, uh, such obstacles is for us to get together and to learn from one another and to learn about one another. Such were the values that were taught by the Prophet Muhammad in his community. These are the blessings that are recited every time the name of the Prophet is mentioned by the followers of Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, when he lived in the city of Medina, after migrating from Mecca, his hometown, to Medina, there he established a society. In that society, there was a diversity. First of all, he made an alliance with the Jews who were present there in the city of Medina. In this alliance, they pledged that they will protect one another, the Muslims and the Jews, in case there is a foreign invasion. And indeed, they held on to that. The freedom of expression, the freedom of religion, is something that is fundamental in Islam, but rather for humanity, in order for it to prosper and to progress. Among his companions, he cherished the diversity. In fact, the person whom he chose to call for the prayers, as later on we will call for the prayers here, was one of his companions who came from Ethiopia. He was a black man. But the Prophet did not make a difference between black or white, an Arab or a non-Arab. But rather it is on the merits, on the basis of the merits. So the person who used to call for the Adhan or the prayers was a black man by the name of Bilal. That position was a very important position we may call it today, just to draw an analogy, it's like the press secretary. The person who comes out to make the announcements or to make the calls before the president comes to make an important speech. So that position was a very important position. And it was given to this man who was not even an Arab. and He was a black man. But the prophet cherished him. Another very close companion of the Prophet was a man by the name of Salman who came from Persia. Such values, such diversities provide strength to us. Now there is this thing about Islam that is circulating around these days saying that it is a religion that cherishes violence. Historically speaking, from the time of the Prophet, it was exactly the opposite of that. In fact, the word Islam comes from Salam, which means peace. When Muslims greet each other, the first thing they say is as salam Alaikum, or peace be upon you. And interestingly, not too long ago, I was reading, you know, a friend of mine who is a Christian gave me a gift, a copy of the Bible. And I was reading in the chapter of Luke, in the book of Luke. And there it says, when Jesus entered into the house, he would say, peace on those who are in this house. Now, if I were to translate this into Arabic, it would be salam on those who are in this house. And that's where you see the fundamental teachings of these Abrahamic faiths are one. The essence is one. Islam is a continuation of the message of Jesus. 
continuation of the message of Moses, the pinnacle delivered by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his divine family. This is the essence of this religion. And in fact, if we take a look at the wars that were fought by the Prophet Muhammad, they were all in defense. He never attacked. The first battle that took place in Islam is known as the Battle of Badr. It took place on the outskirts of Medina where the Prophet resided. He was attacked by the people of Mecca. And like any sovereign nation, which has the right to defend itself, he defended himself and the people who were with him. This was followed by another attack, the second year, the Battle of Uhud, again on the outskirts of Medina. He just defended himself. This was followed by a third attack, a battle known as the Battle of the Trenches, where again, an alliance was made to attack the Prophet and in support of the Prophet, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked his companions, how can we face this alliance? And interestingly, it was Salman, the Persian, who came up with the idea that back in Persia, where I come from, when we are faced with an enemy that we may not be able to defeat, we dig trenches that are wide and deep so the horses of the enemy would not be able to cross. This idea was endorsed by the Prophet and implemented. So you see how diversity gives us strength. Diversity brings us all these ideas that we may not be aware of. And such was the practice of the Prophet Muhammad. He preached about peace not about violence. And the biggest proof of this is when he managed finally to defeat the enemies of Mecca, the people who hurt him, tried to kill him, waged several wars against him. Finally, when he managed to take control of them, he did not kill a single one of them. But rather he said, I forgive you all, go ahead. This is the essence of Islam, to love one another, to respect one another. In fact, the verses we recited earlier talk about manners, respect, <coughs> about dealing with each other with respect, not to backbite, not to belittle, but rather to honor humanity. In 1997, and I'm sorry for those of you who were here last week who heard this. In 1997, then United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, delivered a speech celebrating the 50th anniversary for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was celebrated at the University of Tehran in Iran. Now that's something you don't hear in the news quite often. In his speech, the UN Secretary General said and quoted Imam Ali, who is the Prophet Muhammad's successor and his son-in-law. Imam Ali wrote in a letter that he gave to his governor in Egypt, saying to him that, treat all your subjects with mercy because people in this world fall under one of two categories. They are either your brothers and sisters in faith, or they're your counterpart in humanity. So deal with each and every person with respect. A few, year, a few months ago, back in December, I was invited, now I'm from Canada, you know, I'm a Canadian here, bringing my friendly relationships with you. Luckily, you know, Canada is not playing in the World Cup today like what we saw what happening, you know, so we're all good, thank God. A few months ago, I was invited to the city hall, to the city where I live in. It's a small city called Edmonton. 
in Alberta. And I gave, I mentioned this, that Kofi Annan said this about quoting Imam Ali. After my talk, I had two people approach me. One of them was a Jewish poet. He introduced himself. He said, I'm a Jewish poet. He said, I was so inspired by this sentence of Imam Ali that you quoted, that people in this world are either your brother or sister in faith or they're your equal in humanity, that I'm going to make it my inspiration for writing poetry, a whole poem about this particular sentence. And the other person was an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. who also said, I'm so touched by these words, they're so powerful, that I'm going to teach them to my students, and I'm going to teach them to my children. Such are the essence of Islam, where we respect humanity, we work with people. And as far as women go in Islam, they are given a very highly respected status. In fact, Usually, it is the men who propose to the women. Except in Islam, it is the women who propose to the men. And the reason it is done so that a woman would never ever be forced to get into a marriage against her will. So a woman is the one who proposes to the man in marriage, in Islam. She's respected in all aspects. They can work, they can teach, they can learn in all aspects of the society. And in fact, in 2011, three years ago, the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize was a Muslim woman by the name of Tawakkul Karman from Yemen, who was a journalist. The youngest ever Nobel laureate for peace at the age of 33, with her headscarf, she came and she accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, sharing it with two other ladies at the time. So the headscarf does not stop Muslim women from progressing, from contributing, and from achieving peace prizes as well. Having said this, I would like to leave more time for questions. I would like to leave more time for us to learn about each other. And hence, we have about 20, 25 minutes or so for questions. And I would like to welcome them from you, my dear guests. And I would like to start with ladies, you know, ladies first. So if there are any questions on the ladies' side, I'd be more than happy to address them. Mike here, anybody would like to ask questions? Mike is going there, so you have Okay, anybody? It's great. Yeah. It means the lecture was so clear and concise and perfect. You don't have any questions. I think you will have to continue. Well, let's see. Do, do you have any questions there? <laughs> Yes, go ahead. I have a question about your tradition of fasting. Is uh, at, at what age, like, um, does a, a person be expected to fast, and does that go on for his entire life? Like, if you are an old man or something, are you still expected to fast? You start fasting at the age of nine and it goes on for as long as you can fast. So an old person, if he or she is incapable of fasting, then they're not obliged to fast anymore. Okay, so no problem. I received a question, you know, a written question, interestingly, you know, before I even got here. And the question asks, what is the meaning of jihad and do you think Western media culture understands its meaning? The literal meaning of jihad is struggle. 
to struggle. Muslims who are fasting right now, they're in a state of jihad, depriving themselves from food and water and other desires for almost 20 hours. That's a form of jihad, a form of struggle. It is mistranslated or inaccurately translated in the media as a holy war. It does not mean holy war. That is the essence of the meaning of jihad. The next question says, what does a call for jihad mean? Has it been hijacked by the extremists slash terrorists? Now, has it been hijacked by extremists and terrorists? And the answer is yes. Terrorists, they don't really belong to any religion. They belong to an agenda. They have an agenda that they would like to execute. And irrespective of what comes in their way, they will try to do and execute their agenda. Now, religion is a good excuse for it. And hence you find sometimes throughout history, religion, various religions being used to kill, to go to war, to cause bloodshed in the name of that religion. Because it's a great excuse to do so. Some people in the Muslim world do that as well. Does it go with the teachings of Islam? No, it doesn't. Does it go with the teachings of the Prophet? No, it doesn't. Does it go with the teachings of the Quran? No, it doesn't. What we see happening today sometimes, even in the Muslim world, where some people calling for jihad, sometimes they are called Sunni, but they're not even Sunni. They use that as an excuse. Sometimes they, you know, attack Shias, but they don't even attack only Shias. They even attack others, anyone who doesn't go with their agenda. Last year, in fact, in Syria, some of these so-called Sunni terrorists, although they're not Sunni terrorists, they're terrorists. They entered into a Sunni mosque where there was a sheikh, you know, the imam of the mosque, a Sunni imam. His name is Dr. Muhammad al Buti. He was leading a circle where he was teaching. They attacked him in the mosque and they killed him in the mosque. This is to show that these people don't really have a differentiation between Shia, Sunni or whatever. They have an agenda to execute. And their agenda is to cause disruption, corruption and destruction. And that's basically what we are seeing in the world today. But one thing we can do is for us to learn about one another. This step, this invitation, you coming over here, I've been to several churches, some synagogues. I sit down sometimes with priests and rabbis. We have coffee together to learn about our faiths, to learn about one another. Because once we learn about one another, then we can eradicate a lot of these misconceptions. And we can spread this to our communities. And hence, I strongly encourage everyone to mingle along, especially at the time of the meal, to learn about one another. Because this is the essence of the teachings of Islam. This is what keeps us all united. <clears throat> to learn about one another. Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell us about the differences and similarities between the Shia and the Sunni? The question is, can you tell us about the differences and similarities between Shia and Sunni? Well, they're all Muslims. That's one thing I would like to emphasize. You know, in Canada, back in the 80s, I'm not sure about here in the US, but in Canada in the 80s, a Protestant marrying a Catholic was considered an inter-religious marriage. Although they both are Christians. Islam is not like that. You know, a Sunni marrying a Shia, for example, is not considered 
an interreligious marriage. They are all Muslims. They all pray five times a day. The holy book is the holy book of the Quran. They fast the month of Ramadan. They go to the pilgrimage in the last Islamic month of the year, the 12th Islamic month of the year. And hence, there's a lot of similarities. There is a fundamental difference, and that is with regards to divine succession to the Prophet Muhammad. That is the fundamental difference between Shiites and Sunnis. All Muslims, all Muslims believe in God. The one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that exists within them. This one God has no partners, no associates. Okay. We believe in that. All Muslims believe in all the prophets from Adam all the way to Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him and his divine family. All of them. And in some Muslim traditions, it is said that there were 124,000 prophets. We believe in all those prophets, the 124,000 of them. And all Muslims believe on the day of judgment, that there is a day when we will all be resurrected alive again, and we will be held accountable for our actions. The Shia go a step further. They also believe in divine succession of the Prophet Muhammad. That after the Prophet, we have to follow whomever God chooses that we should follow. And not whomever the people choose whom we should follow. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, according to the Shias and to some Sunnis, he appointed Imam Ali as his successor, his cousin and his son-in-law. But some people, they chose not to follow Imam Ali after the Prophet's death, and they elected another figure to become the successor of the Prophet Muhammad. That's where the essence of the difference is. Who do we turn to for the teachings of Islam after the Prophet Muhammad? Shia say we need to turn to the divine family of the Prophet, whom God chose to be his successors, Sunni say we can turn to any of the companions of the Prophet. And that's basically what caused the, uh, the initial split. So it's a fundamental theological difference between the two. But as far as practices go, they're all Muslims and they all practice religion through praying, fasting, alms, and charity, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yes? have this uh, in, our, in our genetic material, the separation of government and religion. It seems that that's not as uh, striking in the Islamic world because as I understand, the caliphs in the old days, they were the political leaders as well as the religious leaders. They were the source of all authority. Correct. And we hear that there are Al Qaeda or whoever they they are trying to reestablish the caliphate. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to work? <laughs> <laughs> and where 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 is where is the world going with that? Good question. You know. It's interesting when you say in our genetic material, you know, I don't know, are, are you referring to the, the Christian genetic material or are you, referring, like, are you referring to the verse, give to Caesar what's unto Caesar and give to God what's unto God? No. We argue about the separation of church. Of the church and state, yes. So, although there is a debate even among the Christian theologians, you know, whether there is really a, a separation between church and state, you know. So there is that debate even among Christian theologians. From the Islamic perspective, however, okay, we do not see a separation between church and state. Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Prophet, was, was a prophet of God, so he was the head of the religion. At the same time, he was also the political leader. When he was in Medina, he established the Islamic state. Okay. So, 
religion and politics go hand in hand. There are many laws that are passed, but sometimes religion plays a role in how do you interact with these laws. I remember Oregon State was the first state in North America to allow for self-assisted suicide. That was back, I think, in 97 or 98. Now, when that law passed, an exception was made. Those doctors who felt that it is against their religion to do this, had the permission of not to participate. They had the permission to say, I'm not going to do this. So here is a law, okay. but it contradicted to some people's religious teachings. What do you do? Here is religion and state. They go hand in hand. They're not separate. Because state laws will affect the way you practice your religion. When some states started to allow for same-sex marriages a few years ago, I remember the Pope at the time, Pope Benedict, he issued a statement to Americans saying that you should not be supporting this. And I remember there were some individuals writing back saying that, you know, he should stay out of our politics. Now, that is a religious matter. And here we have a political matter. Yet we have the Pope now giving an advice, let's say, about a political matter. So religion and politics, state and politics and religion cannot really be separated from one another. They really affect the way you come out with laws. So in Islam, it recognizes this. And hence, there is no separation between church and state. Now, with regards to what we are seeing today with some Muslims claiming that we would like to establish a Khilafat. No. Khilafat means succession to the Prophet. No. Khalifa, it comes from the word Khalifa, which means a successor, the Prophet's successor. The actual word simply just means successor. But it was used, was given to those who succeeded the Prophet Muhammad, and hence it was known as the Khilafat. Now those who are doing this, they are just driven by a political agenda. They want to govern. There is nothing religious there at all. And as I mentioned, those people, when they find any obstacle coming their path, whether you're a Shia, or you're a Sunni, or a Christian, they don't really care. They will try to get rid of you because that's their political agenda. Now, where are we going with all this? Well, the Abrahamic faiths, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, believe in a day when the Son of Man will return. Now, that Son of Man could be Jesus, or as we Muslims believe, it is Jesus along with one of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. and one of the divine successors of the Prophet Muhammad, the ones chosen by God and by the Prophet. And his name is Al-Mahdi. So Al-Mahdi, according to Islamic traditions, will come back at the end of time to spread justice, to fight injustice, to fight corruption. And he will be joined with Jesus. So they will be actually joining hands together, according to Islamic traditions. The Bible talks about the return or the coming of the Son of Man. The Torah talks about the coming of the Messiah. So there is that tradition there. When will that happen? We have no clue. But we know it will happen, given these three Abrahamic faiths. There will be a time when justice will prevail. Any questions from that side? No. All good? Did you tell him there's a quiz before dinner? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I hope you can benefit from the time that we spent together here. One thing that is really important to myself and to everyone is we need to learn to respect one another, to really learn to embrace one another. I mentioned last week, you know, I don't really, uh, I'm not really a big fan of the word tolerant. Tolerant means I tolerate you. But rather, I am a big fan of the word to embrace, to work with you. That's a better word. And that's a word we would like to aim for. We are blessed in this part of the world with security, with peace, and we pray to God to continue to bless us with peace and security. But we also need to work hand in hand to expand on this, the respect that we have for each other, the respect we have for our diversity. As was mentioned earlier, if you look around today, you'll find people from different parts of the world. Many of them immigrated here decades ago. And now they're all proud to be American citizens. Many of them now are working as doctors, engineers, laborers, contributing to the society. And that's really who we are. We are working for the betterment of our community, our society, our world at large. But this has to be with a seed that we plant. And that seed is the seed of love, respect. And then the tree will grow. And I'm sure it will grow. And there is hope. We just have to work at it. Wherever we go, whatever community we speak to, it's important that we say that in every community there are some bad people. But it doesn't mean that they're all bad. In every society there are some bad apples, but doesn't mean that they're all bad. And if we can spread that kind of message where we need to work together, respect each other, then our world will be a much better place than what we see today. Unfortunately, the poverty we see in the world today has caused a lot of ignorance. And with poverty and ignorance, that's a deadly combination to breed the terrorism that we are seeing today. If we can come together to start investing, not in war, but in social services. If we can invest into building schools, hospitals, providing for the poor, then I guarantee you, Terrorism will be decreasing significantly. But when you have so much social injustice, then you have a lot of problems. There is a professor of economics, he's a Muslim, by the name of Dr. Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. You know, interestingly, Within the past decade, three Muslim Nobel laureates have won the Nobel Prize for Peace. In 2005, Dr. Mohammed al Baradi of Egypt. In 2006, Dr. Mohammed Yunus of Bangladesh. And in 2011, Tawakkul Kamran of Yemen. That lady I spoke about earlier. Dr. Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2006, he writes in one of his books, the problem we see today in the world is not because, he says, the lack of resources. We have enough resources in the world to keep everyone happy. The problem, he says, however, is the lack of fair distribution. He says, 94% of the world's wealth today is being controlled in the hands of 
40% of the world's population. The remaining 6% is divided by 60%. So if you have a pie and you cut it into 100 slices and you have 100 people in the room, logic says each one will get a slice and they all will be happy. Reality says, however, you take 94 slices and you give them to 40 people in the room. And the remaining 60 people in the room, you tell them, well, you have to share the six remaining slices. That's what's causing the problem today in the world. Now, we're not talking about a socialistic, you know, communist, you know, ideology. Not at all. Just talking about logic. Fair distribution. Sharing. Like they say, sharing is caring. Just give a little bit to people. And if we can learn as a community now, now we cannot change the world maybe, but step by step we can. We can start with our community here, with our society, and then aim higher. So if we can use our knowledge to respect one another, to work with one another, to collaborate with one another on social projects that would benefit our communities, that's something we can do. And that would make a big difference in our communities, in our societies, and hopefully one day in our world as well. I would like to thank you all for joining us one more time. Shortly, we're gonna be preparing for the prayers. We have two prayers that we will be praying. Muslims worldwide pray five times a day. The first prayer we do is at dawn. So these days it's about 3.30 a.m. The second prayer we do is at noon. Then we have an afternoon prayer and then we have the evening prayer, which is about this time. At the time just after sunset. And then we have the night prayer, which just follows that evening prayer. So five times all Muslims worldwide. And when we pray, we face Mecca, which in this center, in this mosque, is this way. So those of you, the ladies and the gents, you're facing Mecca now. Wonderful. You know. So you're more than welcome to join us for prayers too, if you wish. The prayers are conducted in Arabic. So all Muslims all over the world, they learn this particular prayers and they know how to recite them in Arabic. These five prayers have a specific structure, as you will see. Specific methodology, specific things to be said in the prayers. And you will more than welcome to observe us as we pray. After we finish the prayers, then we'll go and break our fast and have our breakfast or dinner. And that's where we would love to meet you and sit down and talk with you all at that stage. Thank you all very much. God bless you all. And I pray, may Allah Almighty bless this whole world with peace and security, love and kindness and affection and compassion. And may God Almighty bless us all to be united such that we are workers for the sake of justice and humanity. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you. Oh, my God.